invite you to take your uh, program out, to take your study guide out. I want to begin with a little bit of review. Last night we looked at this metal man. In fact, let's read our first paragraph there on your study guide. It says, here at the Discover Prophecy Seminar, we believe that Jesus is coming soon. Is there anyone else out there that shares that conviction that Jesus is coming soon? I'm going to give you reason tonight why I believe that. We asked the question, how do we know that this is true? And how soon is soon? People have been saying for centuries, people have been saying for decades that He's coming soon. And that raises the question, how soon is soon? How can we be sure that the second coming really is imminent? Fortunately, the Bible powerfully, compellingly, and clearly answers these very questions. Let's turn our attention to the Bible and see what it has to say about this important topic. Now, let's do a little bit of review here. Just there, a quick review of Daniel 2. A great metal... What should be in that blank, everyone? A great metal man of Daniel chapter 2 tells the story of the history of this planet. The five elements of that image, gold, silver, brass, iron, and clay, represent the five major kingdoms. That's exactly right. You've got it. From the time of Daniel to the setting up of God's kingdom. Babylon was the head of gold. Medo-Persia were the chest and arms of silver. Greece, the belly and thighs of bronze. Rome, the long legs of iron. But Rome was not conquered, you remember. It was divided, just as God's Word said. And so here Daniel, in about 150 words, accurately foretells 2,500 years of Earth's history, beginning in the time in which he lived Babylon, moving through the whole sweep of history, down to divided Rome, today what we would call modern Europe. Today we live in those feet of iron and clay, partly strong and partly weak, and the very next thing that happened, you remember, is that God would set up His own kingdom. God would set up what, everyone? His own kingdom, and it was represented by a what? Do you remember? by a stone, and where did it hit the image? Who remembers? Where did it hit the image? Hit the image in the feet, and it smashed the gold, the silver, the bronze, and the iron to bits. And then it says that that stone that struck the image grew and became a great... Does anyone remember? A great mountain. Look at the, back, the last part of that paragraph there. The very last sentence, second to the last sentence says, the dream applied to the what? Who remembers? The latter days. The kingdom of God is at hand. Beloved, as you take a look at that image, that great timeline that moves us through the sweep of history from 600 years before the time of Jesus until now, I want you to notice that there is nothing below the feet. That's it. As we said last night, God said there would be Babylon and there was Babylon. Number one, God said that there would be Medo-Persia and there was Medo-Persia too. God said that there would be Greece and there was Greece. Number three, God said that there would be Rome and there was Rome. Number four, God said that Rome would be divided and it was divided. Number five, and God said that Rome would remain divided and it has remained divided despite the overtures of some of the so-called great men of history and it has remained divided to this day. The very next thing to happen is that God will set up His own kingdom. That's the next thing. And so someone might ask legitimately and rightfully, when will that happen? And that is our message tonight. We asked the question last night, what would you wager? If you were a gambling person, what would you wager? Just think it through. You don't have to be a religious person. You don't have to be a theologian. You don't have to be a super spiritual person just to think about this logically. We discussed already that historians tell us about the past and news anchor people tell us about the present, but God alone can tell us about the future. Can you say amen to that? And God is sending us here a signal in the apocalyptic books of Daniel and Revelation. He's saying that it's getting nearer and nearer and nearer. Now you're going to ask, how much more time do we have? The answer is, I don't know. But I'll show you tonight, I don't think we have much time left. I don't think we have much time left. The stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. The end of all things, is it here, is it near, or is it near fear? This is not just something that theologians and Bible scholars are dealing with, not at all. Even popular media magazines like Newsweek and Time, Prophecy, what the Bible says about the end of the world. If you can see the writing here, the end of the world, 
Apocalypse Now. Will computers melt down? Will society? A guide to millennium madness. It's not just popular culture that has an interest in the end of all things, what's called apocalyptic studies. Notice this remarkable quotation from a man by the name of Bernard McGinn from the University of Chicago Divinity School. He says, over the past 30 years, more scholarship has been devoted to apocalypticism, that's last day events, than in the last 300. In other words, from, a, from an academic point of view, from a scholastic point of view, there has been more research, more study into last day events in the last 30 years than in the foregoing, the previous 300 years. Not only is there an increase in the common media, in the, in the mass media, even scholars are interested in what is going on. It's almost like there's something tangible, something palpable in the air. People have a sense that something is about to happen. And I would say that has increased tenfold since 9-11. The, the, the post-9-11 world is a very different world than the pre-9-11 world, and everything is in flux. People are wondering, what is going on? And I want to tell you tonight, and I believe this with all of my heart, with all of my soul, with every bit of my being, that the Bible alone can give us real, compelling, and true answers about what is going on in the world today. The politicians do not have the answers. Somebody say amen. amen. They might have some of the answers, and they'll do their best, and hey, listen, fine, 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 but they do not have the ultimate answers. The world religious leaders, many of them do not have the answers. God alone has the answers as to what's happening. He's given them to us in His Word, and we can know them if we'll study and look at them. The end of the world, is it here, near, or mere fear? You might be saying, well, that's religious talk, David. That's religious talk. Look at your study guide there. The subheading says, what do the experts say? What do the experts say? It is not only the Bible and Bible believers that insist we are living in strange and unusual times. You say, oh, that's religious talk. You wild-eyed religious fanatics have been saying these kinds of things a long time. Oh, sure, Jesus is coming. Oh, sure, the end of the world is coming. We've heard it all before. Beloved, let me tell you something. I was not a Bible believer. I had no interest in things religious. I had no interest in things Christian. Twenty-three years old, I had no interest in these things. And God got my attention. And I think I can say with a degree of objectivity that we are living in strange and unusual times. The world appears to be coming apart at the seams. Do you tend to agree with that or disagree with that? I want to show you tonight that it is not just so-called religious people that believe we are living in strange and unusual times. In fact, you'll notice that there in your study guide. Many recognized experts and authorities in various fields suggest that we are living in extraordinary and unique period of Earth's history. Many of these individuals are not writing from a biblical or a so-called theological perspective. They are simply writing from an observational and an evidentiary perspective they see that the evidence points in a fearful and unusual direction. Turn the page if you would. I cite for you this evening as, as case in point number one, a man by the name of Eugene Linden. Eugene Linden is an award-winning journalist, and several years ago he wrote a book entitled The Future in Plain Sight. The subtitle of the book was Nine Clues to the Coming Instability nine clues to the coming instability. Now, when Mr. Linden says the coming instability, again, he's not writing from a religious perspective, he's not writing from a biblical perspective, not at all. When he uses that language, the coming instability, sometimes he calls it massive global instability, that is secular code speak for the end of the world as we know it. Nine clues, he says, to the coming instability. Let me just share with you very quickly Eugene Linden's concerns. Notice, none of them are biblical. None of them are so-called religious reasons. This is what he says. We're not going to spend time going into them, but let's just look at a few of them. He says the collapse of the global economy is a real potential. The migration of the poor to the cities. Population explosion, both urban and rural. Global warming. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. The economic disparity between the rich and the poor. You say it with me. The rich get Richer and the poor get 
poor. He says it's reaching epidemic proportions. He goes on, the collapse of bioecosystems. Number seven, water and food shortages. Number eight, infectious diseases. He cites both a resurgence of old diseases and a resilience of modern diseases. He says that the diseases are getting smarter and more resilient to antibiotics, etc. And number nine, he cites radical fundamentalism in religions. Notice again, Dr. Linden here is not writing from a biblical perspective. And he says we are living in strange, unusual, and extraordinary times. I cite for you now a man that is considered by many to be the single greatest scientific mind on the planet. With a raising of hands, how many of you are familiar with who this man is? Dr. Stephen Hawking. Okay, good. Many of you would be. He's authored the uh, best-selling science book of all time. It's a book entitled A Brief History of Time. Again, he's considered by many to be the greatest scientific mind on the planet. He's hailed as Einstein's successor. You're looking at his picture there and you're thinking it doesn't look like he's very fit. He's very well, and that's exactly right. He has a terrible disease, Lou Gehrig's disease, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. He can't even speak, as a matter of fact. All he has is just a very small amount of movement in one of his fingers, which he is able to use a, a very sophisticated computer and sort of craft sentences, etc., etc., and he does presentations. He spoke recently at a, a, uh, a group, uh, a convention of religious leaders and thought leaders and, and academic leaders, not religious leaders, academic leaders and others, and this is how he concluded, Dr. Stephen Hawking concluded his um, lecture there that was entitled, Is Man, Mankind, Determined or Free? I want you to notice this. Now, the language is a little obtuse, and I apologize for that, but you'll get the thrust of it right away. Dr. Stephen Hawking said this, I fear that since the evolutionary process, and of course he believes in the process of evolution, we'll talk more about that maybe later in our seminar. I fear that since the evolutionary process has worked through the dialectic of determinism and aggression, our long-term survival and any hope for our what? Species is in question. You see what he's saying? He says, I'm concerned. I'm very concerned. I mean, the man holds the Sir Isaac Newton Chair of Mathematics at Cornell University, or Cambridge University. He says, I'm concerned. Notice what he says next. However, here's his solution. However, says Dr. Hawking, if we can keep from destroying each other for the next hundred years, he said this six years ago, sufficient technology will have been developed to distribute humanity to various what? Planets and then no one tragedy or atrocity will eradicate us all at the same time. You see what he's saying? We are living in strange times, we're living in unusual times. He says, I'm concerned for the long-term survival of our species. However, if we can just keep from destroying one another for 100 years, technology will have been developed and you ma'am might go to Mars and you ma'am might go to another planet. We can go to different planets and then no one tragedy or atrocity will eradicate us all at the same time. Am I the only person here tonight that thinks that that sounds just a little crazy? <laughs> now, that is not out of disrespect to Dr. Hawking. He's a brilliant man. He's, he's, a, he's a wonderful man. I hope that the man is converted and, and accepts the Lord Jesus as his personal Savior. The point is, is that is a little strange. I found this cover here from Time Magazine. I thought it was kind of cute. They show a sort of astronaut-looking man there walking his robo-dog, and it says, In the future will we... That's exactly what Dr. Stephen Hawking is advocating. He says, hey, look, at this planet is waxing old like a garment. This planet is groaning under the weight of all of these different things. This worries him. Again, not from a religious perspective, not from a biblical perspective, not from a theological perspective, simply from a scientific or observational perspective. Let's turn our attention now to the Bible. I cite these instances for you, and we'll give a few more momentarily, to show that this is not just wild-eyed, so-called religious fanatics that believe we're living in strange and unusual times. In fact, I would say, if you don't think we're living in strange and unusual times, you're not paying attention. I saw a bumper sticker the other day that said, if you're not outraged, you're not paying attention. One out of every 25 verses in the New Testament is related to the what, everyone? to the second coming, one out of every 25 verses, it is the preeminent theme, one of them, of the New Testament. Let me give you five verses from the book of Revelation. They're all right there in your study guide. And what I want you to notice is that all of these verses have something in common. See if you can pick it out. Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. John says, Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, him being Jesus. 
Even they who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. That's Revelation 1.7. Notice the next verse. Revelation 3.11. Behold, I am coming. What's that word, everyone? Quickly. Hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown. The Bible has promised those that put their faith in Jesus a crown of righteousness. He says, I'm coming quickly. Hold on so that no one else gets the crown that belongs rightfully to you. Revelation 22, verse 7. Behold, I am coming. What, everyone? Quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. That book, of course, being the book of Revelation. Verse 12 of the same chapter. And behold, I am coming. Say it with me. Quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. Still one more. Verse 20. He who testifies to these things, Jesus himself speaking, says, Surely I am coming. What? Quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Five times, I'm coming quickly. I'm coming quickly. I'm coming quickly. What do these verses have in common? There's a sense of urgency here. God is saying it's not time to be lackadaisical. It's not time to be lazy anymore. You're saying, well, wait a minute, the book of Revelation was written 2,000 years ago. You're right. But in the book of Revelation, there is a key that lets us know when quickly is really quickly. And notice that there in your study guide. What do these verses have in common? There's a sense of urgency in every one of them. Clearly, the second coming is a prominent component of Revelation. It is the capstone of the book, the whole Bible, and of God's plan of salvation. But notice the next subheading. How quick is quick? How soon is soon? And how close is close? These are excellent questions. These are the very kinds of questions that people ask today. They might say something like this. People have been saying for years that Jesus would return. How do you know that He actually will? Is there anyone in here today who's ever heard something like that, a variation of that? You've tried to share with a family member, tried to share with a friend, and they said, come on, people have been saying that forever. How do you really know? Raise your hands if you've heard that before. Okay, sure, many of us have heard it before, and it's sometimes said with kind of a snicker, a snide sense of, come on, get over it. Notice this. The key is in our next verse, which is also in Revelation. Revelation chapter 16 and verse 15. Behold, I am coming as a thief, Jesus says. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Now, this is not speaking of literal nakedness. It's speaking of spiritual nakedness, which is what happens when you've not put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's not the main thing we want to look at right now, though. What I want you to see is that the operative word in this passage is that word right there that begins with a W, watches. What is that word, everyone? In fact, you'd write that in right there. It says, what is the operative word in this passage? And the word is watch. The word watch means to look, to see. In fact, if you remember those verses that we were just quoting from Revelation, Revelation 1, all the ones that are listed there, many of them began with the word behold. What does the word behold mean? What does that mean? Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. What does it mean to behold? It means to look. That's exactly right. And, and so you have this, this reverberating bottom line here. They're saying, look, 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 look. And then here he says, blessed is he who looks. Now, very interesting. Let me show you several other verses here. In fact, I think I've got them all for you. Matthew 24, 42, right there. Take this home and study it yourself. Jesus speaking, he says, watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. Notice Jesus says, watch. Next one, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 4 and 6, the Apostle Paul, notice what he says, But you, brethren, writing to the church in Thessalonica, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. There's that language again. Many people have heard that language, he comes as a thief, he comes as a thief. Many people don't know what that means. We'll talk about that in another seminar, another presentation. But notice this, that day is the second coming. Notice verse 6, Therefore, let us not, what everyone? sleep as others do. Paul knew that there would be people that would be asleep. Paul knew that there would be people that would say, Ooh, oh yeah, we've heard that all before. No, let us not therefore sleep as others do, but let us what? Watch and be sober. That means be serious minded. It doesn't mean you can't have a little fun. Nobody in this room likes to have fun more than David Ashrick. I guarantee you that. You ask my wife, she'll tell you that's the truth. But we should be sober-minded about the times in which we're living. Can someone say amen to that? Amen. He, says, he says, watch. John in Revelation says, watch. 
Jesus in Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, says, Watch! Here Paul is saying, Watch! And Peter actually says the same thing here in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 7. But the end of all things is at hand, he says. Therefore, be serious. There it is again. And what's the next word? Watchful in your prayers. John says, Watch. Paul says, Watch. Peter says, Watch. Jesus says, Watch. Is there any question in anybody's mind tonight that the Bible is telling us to watch for something? The question is, for what? Does that sound good? Say, oh, keep your eye out. I'll tell you, keep your eye out. Keep your eye out. But you're going to say, um, David, what am I keeping my eye out for? Does that make sense, everyone? Yes or no? Notice your study guide. What do all of these verses have in common? They all deal with the end of time. Each of those verses we just looked up deal with the end of time. All of these verses tell us to watch, but the question is, for what? The disciples questioned Jesus on one occasion about the end of the world. Open your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew what chapter, everyone? First book of the New Testament, you can find that. If you're sitting next to someone who has difficulty finding it, just help them out. First book of the New Testament, right between Malachi and Mark. Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. We're being told to watch. And the question is, for what? And here's the answer. Matthew chapter 24, beginning in verse 1. Then Jesus went out and departed from the where, everyone? From the temple. Jesus left the temple. And his disciples came to show him the buildings of the temple. They were trying to cheer him up. The reason they were trying to cheer him up, if you read in the first three ver or the last three verses of the chapter before it, Jesus has left the temple for the last time. In fact, he says in verse 37, O Jerusalem of the ch previous chapter, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who were sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Never forget that. God is a gentleman. He will not force his way into your life. He begs and he hopes and he calls and he pleads, but God will not force. Can someone say amen? amen. Jesus says, I, w I want to do bring you under my wings as a hen gathers her chicks, but you are not willing. Notice verse 38. See, your house is left to you desolate. Verse 39, for I say to you, you will see me no more till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And he walked out of the temple. That was the last time that Jesus, the Messiah, the very one to whom the temple pointed, would ever set foot in those precincts. He walks out. His heart was burdened. His heart was sad. He went up on a mountain called the Mount of Olives, and the disciples could tell there was something wrong. Jesus had begun his public ministry. You might remember the story. He went in and he threw all the money changers out. Remember that story? And he said, take these things out of here. See if you can repeat it with me. You have made my father's house a den of thieves. So at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he said, my father's house. But here at the end, he says, your house is left to you desolate. Three and a half years earlier, it was my father's house. At the end of his ministry, it's your house. Why? Because the Jewish nation had consistently rejected the evidences of Jesus' Messiahship. He says, hey, listen, what more can I do? You won't see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He goes up. He sits on the Mount of Olives. The disciples come in verse 1. We've already read it to try and cheer him up. Oh, Jesus, look at how beautiful the temple is. Oh, Jesus, look at how the sun glistens off of its glorious marble walls. But Jesus would not be comforted. Look at verse 2. Jesus said, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say unto you, not one stone will be left here upon another that will not be what? Thrown down. The very thing that the disciples were trying to cheer Jesus with, Jesus says, Do you see it all? It's going to be destroyed. In fact, it'll be so destroyed, so utterly decimated that there won't even be one stone upon another that is the temple destroyed, Jerusalem destroyed. And in the minds of the disciples, they're thinking, What? The destruction of the temple, the destruction of Jerusalem, surely he's talking about the end of the age, what the Greeks called the eschaton. Oh, that must mean the end of all things. Notice verse 3. Now as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the what, everyone? The end of the world or the end of the age. The disciples thought they were asking one question. 
They thought they were asking one question. When will all of these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? But that's really two questions. And what Jesus does is he parallels the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70 under the Roman Emperor Titus and the end of the world, and that's really what Matthew chapter 24 is, is this marvelous answer in which Jesus takes these two events and interweaves them in a marvelous tapestry. Now let's look at our study guide here. Consider Matthew chapter 24. We're on the bottom of the second page. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus deals with the issue of the end of the world. In this chapter, Jesus masterfully, the word is, parallels the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. with the destruction of the world at the end of the age. In this parallel, Jesus employs two revealing and helpful analogies for understanding the last days and the end of the world. Let's look at these two analogies. The first one is actually found in verse 8. The first one is found in verse 8. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 8. Now I'm reading this morning, or this evening rather, from the New King James Version. It says, all these are the beginning of sorrows. All these are the beginning of sorrows. How many of you have a translation that says the same thing there in Matthew chapter 24 verse 8? All these are the beginning of sorrows. Who has something that says, who has a translation that says something different than that? What does yours say? Birth pangs. That's exactly right. That's what the Greek word is. Just as the RSV says here, all of this is the beginning of birth pangs. In other words, contractions, ladies. That's the Greek word that Jesus is here employing. He was probably speaking in Aramaic, of course, but, but here Jesus says, all of this, you say all of what? We'll get there in just a moment. He uses the analogy of contractions. We'll come back to that. He employs a second analogy. As you turn the page there, you can write this down. Look in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 32. Matthew 24 and verse 32. Matthew chapter 24, what verse, everyone? 32. 32. Jesus says, now learn this parable. A parable is a story that illustrates a larger spiritual significance. Now learn this parable from the what, everyone? The fig tree. Hmm, that's interesting. Jesus is going to teach us a story here from a tree, a, a lesson from a tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is what, everyone? Near. Now notice verse 33. He makes the application. So also, when you see all these things, know that it, it in the context is the second coming, know that it is near even at the doors. Jesus employs two analogies here. The two analogies are this. Number one, labor pains, and number two, a budding fig tree. Those of us here in Michigan know what Jesus is talking about. Now, we don't have many fig trees, but we have lots of other kind of trees, and we have winters here. I grew up in South Dakota, and I know something about winters, and we know when spring is just around the corner, or I should say at least we think we know when spring is just around the corner. I've heard it said, if you don't like the weather in Michigan, wait five minutes, right? Where I come from in South Dakota, we have two seasons. We have winter and road construction. Seems like you have the same right here in Michigan as well. We know that something is about ready to happen when, when the leaves begin to appear and the branch gets tender. Jesus says, pay attention. Uses these two analogies, labor pains and a budding fig tree. These analogies have three things in common three things in common. Number one, they are both visible. They are both what, everyone? Visible. visible. Write that down in your study guide there. Number two, they are both progressive. That is, they start here and they move toward here, and as they move, they increase in frequency and in intensity. They're progressive. And number three, they are climactic. The budding fig tree announces summer. The labor pains of a woman's uh, contractions announce a child. They all end at something, an event. You say, now what is it? What are these things that we're supposed to watch for? Peter says, watch. John says, watch. Jesus says, watch. Paul says, watch, watch, watch. We haven't even talked about what we're watching for, but we know we should be watching for something. He gives two parables, the fig tree and the labor pains. These are visible, progressive, and climactic. And you say, well, well, what is it? Go back to Matthew chapter 24. The disciples have asked Jesus the question. 
Verse 3, when will all of this happen? What will be the sign of the end of the age? And Jesus says in verse 4, the very first words out of his mouth, take heed that no one, what? In other words, be careful that no one deceives you. In fact, he says that three times in this one chapter. Be careful that no one deceives you, that no one deceives you, that no one deceives you. Friends, the only thing that you can be guaranteed to, to keep, that, that will keep you from being deceived is knowing the Bible for yourself. Can someone say amen to that? I could stand up here and say something wrong. In fact, I'll tell you this. If I ever do say something that's wrong, don't come back. You don't have to come back. If what I say doesn't come from the Bible, don't come back. What I like to tell Christians is this. You should know your Bible well enough to know when a minister misquotes it. Are you with me? And you pay attention to me. Sometimes I'll purposefully misquote it just to see if you're paying attention. So well, that's not what it says. You, you hang in there. Jesus gave these signs. He said, be careful that you're not deceived. And he gives us here ten signs. Not all of them come from Matthew chapter 24, but most of them do. Ten signs of the times. Again, I just want to underscore that these are not just religious people that say these things. These are not just so-called religious, spiritual people that think that we are living in strange and unusual times. People like Eugene Linden, people like Dr. Stephen Hawking say, wow, we're living in strange and unusual times. Jesus says, I'll show you what it's going to be like. Jesus gives ten signs of the times. Notice there in verse 5. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. Notice it says that many will come in my name and will deceive what, everyone? Many. many. People will come and say, I am the Christ. The very first sign that Jesus gives, signs in the religious world, he says there will be a proliferation of false Christs and false prophets. Do we see that in our day and age today? Sure, I've just, just quickly off the top of my mind here selected a few of them for you. Jim Jones, that's going to be a familiar name to you. Uh, Jose Luis de Jesus Miranda. Anybody know who this guy is? You're going to in just a moment. Sun Young Moon, David Koresh, Marshall Applewhite. He's the one that's in the background of the picture there. The man who led 39 people to kill themselves there in San Clemente, California so that they could go ride around in a spaceship behind the comet hale -Bopp. How many of you remember that one? Right? Jesus says there will be a state of general religious confusion just before I return. And isn't that the case? Let's just talk for a moment as a case in point, just to show you how naive and how gullible people can be. Now, I don't want to pick on anyone. No, 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 that is not my purpose. I'm a friendly person. I love people. I love to spend time with people. But, but let's just look at how gullible people can be. Take, for example, number two there, this Jose Luis de Jesus Miranda. I was introduced to this fellow about six months ago when someone sent me a, a clip on the Internet, a show that he had done on NBC's Today Show. This guy claims to be Jesus. I was on his website just today. I thought you might like to take a look at it. There's his official English website. Not going to tell you the name of it. Why should we give this guy any more credit than he, than he, he deserves? No credit whatsoever. But if you can see in the, in the upper right-hand corner here, it says, The man Christ Jesus, Dr. Jose Luis de Jesus Miranda, is coming to the United States of America. The King of Kings and Lord of Lords has arrived in America. This is the official release from his website. This is a direct quote from his website, Mr. Miranda's website. With over 30 countries already reached, more than 350 educational centers, his own television and radio satellite channels, 300 plus TV and radio programs, an entourage of 300 plus faithful pastors, and a ministry of millions of followers growing in numbers every day. The nations are shaking as the man Christ Jesus is leading the biggest reform the world has ever seen. This is from his official website. The man has an estimated 5 to 10 million followers who genuinely believe that he is Jesus Christ. You think this guy's just whistling Dixie? You say, oh, David, that's no big deal. There's a guy down my street that thinks he's Jesus Christ. Yeah, but has the guy down your street appeared on CNN? Has the guy down your street appeared on CBS National News, Fox News Live, NBC's Today Show, and dozens of local and Latino networks? Do a little Google search on this guy. This guy claims to be Jesus. You watch the interviews with him there on Anderson Cooper. Anderson Cooper says to him straight out, Are you Jesus? He says, I'm Jesus and I'm greater than Jesus. Oh. And then they cut away to his followers and they're all rejoicing and dancing around, holding up signs that say, The Son of Man is here. The Son of Man is here. Now, beloved, 
We don't want to make fun of anybody. In fact, we want to pray. But the point is this. The guy is a 60-year-old ex-heroin addict who spent time in prison. And you have hundreds of thousands, potentially millions of people that say, Oh, Jesus is here. How could they possibly believe such a ridiculous thing? They're not studying their Bibles. Jesus said that's what it would be like just before he returned. Other examples could be given. Notice the next sign that Jesus gives. Verse 6. And you will hear of wars and of rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Do we live in a time where there are wars and rumors of wars, yes or no? Yes. Atheistic philosopher Frederick Nietzsche said the 20th century will be the bloodiest ever, and he was right. More people were killed in war in the last century than in the previous 20 centuries combined, beloved. We have incomprehensibly deadly weapons. Wars continue today unabated. The post-9-11 world of the so-called war on terror is a strange new land that we're just exploring. And frankly, it's terrifying. They don't call it terrorism for nothing. Despite promises of peace, there is no end in sight. Jesus said there would be wars and rumors of wars. It reminds me of a story. A man by the name of Richard J. Gatling drew this patent drawing and submitted it to the United States Patent Office May 19th, 1865. And, and this was a gun that, that you could, you know, the, 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 you probably see in the old West movies and you turn a crank like this and it was basically the first machine gun. And uh, he was showing his patent to several arms manufacturers and guns manufacturers in his day. And, and they did an unveiling and the people were walking around this, this gun and they were all looking at it. And, and one of the, the arms, uh, the, the, the gun manufacturers looked at Mr. Gatling and said, But Mr. Gatling, won't this weapon make war all the more terrible? I mean, the loss of life will be so easy now. I mean, people can just be mowed down in a moment, in a second. I mean, Mr. Gatling, the, won't this weapon make war more terrible? And Mr. Gatling, as the story goes, looked that man right in the eye and he said, No, this weapon will make war impossible. What he was saying is this. People will see the futility of war. I mean, it will be so easy to kill that people will see how foolish it really is. How wrong was Mr. Gatling? When today we have single weapons, single bombs that can annihilate tens of thousands of people in a moment. August 9th, 1945, 73,884 people killed when a bomb was dropped on Nagasaki. Three days earlier, 60,000 were killed when a bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. So wrong was Mr. Gatlin. The Gatlin gun didn't make war more impossible. It made it more terrible. And today we have weapons of mass destruction and weapons of war that could destroy the planet multiplied hundreds of times over. We live in an age where war is on proliferation, not on the decrease. Is this true, yes or no? Absolutely true. Jesus said it would be just like that before he returned. But Jesus went on. There are still more signs. You're still there in Matthew chapter 24. Verse 7, For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places. Famines. The United Nations tells us that one-sixth of the earth is experiencing famine right here today. The most conservative estimates are that somewhere between 50 and 90,000 people starve to death every single day. Many countries are not blessed like the United States of America and are not exporting countries. In fact, many countries produce not enough food to feed their own population. And if it wasn't for countries like the United States, many countries would just literally wither up. Suffering goes beyond these mere numbers. Here, living in Sterling Heights or wherever we live, it's, it, these just look like numbers on a screen, but these are real people that are really dying of starvation. Can you think of a worse way to die? Rapidly decreasing agricultural lands and world population is becoming unsus unsustainable. Jesus said that the last days would be marked by famines. He said there would be pestilences. You say, what's a pestilence? A pestilence is not your kid brother or your kid sister. <laughs> a pestilence is a noxious illness. Do we live in an age of illnesses and diseases today? Sure, AIDS epidemic in many developing countries. SARS, I mean, some of these diseases you never heard of before 10 years ago. SARS, bird flu, uh, Ebola virus, the West Nile virus, so-called mad cow disease. 
Eugene Linden already showed us that there's a resurgence and a resilience of many diseases. In fact, you just do a little Google search on flu epidemic and there are many world health professionals that are very concerned that if there was a flu outbreak, it could literally kill millions of people. Lifestyle related diseases are still the number one cause of death. Jesus said there would be earthquakes. The number of known earthquakes and of deadly earthquakes has dramatically increased in 100 years or so. Now, I want you to notice what I say there. I choose my language very carefully. I didn't say the actual number of earthquakes has increased. That's debatable. You go on the USGS website, the United States Geological Survey, and they seem to suggest that the number has not actually increased. But I'll tell you what has increased. Number one, we, we are more sophisticated now with our seismological devices, and so we know that more are happening, and so there's the appearance of more. But number two, because people are moving toward more urban centers when earthquakes do take place instead of one or two or five thousand dying you have earthquakes where tens of thousands of people die like the tsunami that just happened December 26 2004 in which 300,000 people lost their lives in one of the greatest natural disasters in all human experience and it happened because of an earthquake Jesus said there would be earthquakes they would be deadly they would be prominent the first five signs of the times. The last five, destructive weather patterns. Jesus said in Luke chapter 21 and verse 25 and verse 26, these words, And there will be signs in the sun and the moon and stars and on the earth distress of nations and perplexity, because the roaring of the sea and the waves. Weren't we just talking about the tsunami? People fainting with fear. Look at this verse 26, phenomenal. People fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming on the world for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. What he's saying is the world is going to look like it's falling apart at the seams. The world is going to look like it's going to hell in a handbasket and people are going to be basically fainting and freaking out because they don't know what's happening. Is that the world we live in, yes or no? That is the world we live in. And if people would just take a moment to stop and really look around they'd see that things are not business as usual. It's not status quo any longer, but we have distractions that keep us occupied. So we're not paying attention to really how things are going. I'll talk about that more in just a moment. Here are just a few. I collect these things. Here's just a few uh, 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 magazine covers that I scanned in. I, I don't know if you can read the writing here, but Discover Magazine is hardly a theological journal. And here it says, what in the world is wrong with our weather? They're asking that from an evidentiary basis, not a religious basis. The one there, Life Magazine, the year of the killer weather. Why has nature gone mad? And do I have to tell you anything about hurricanes? Last year was the first time in the history of, of recorded hurricanes where the, the, the meteorologists had to go all the way through the, the, the 23 or whatever it is, 22 letters picked out, and they had to start with alpha, beta, gamma, etc. We know about it, don't we? There is an environmental connection and there is an increasing number of scientists and world leaders who are saying, yeah, I'll tell you why the weather's getting worse. It's not just because we're going through a cycle. Just people say, oh, you know, these meteor meteorological and climatological, these things go in cycles. And some people are saying, yeah, but we're accelerating the cycle by adding to it. Now, listen, I'm not a scientist, but, but the world is not that big, beloved. I know that because my home is in Wyoming and my wife's family lives in California and every year we drive from Michigan to California. It doesn't take us that long to do it, really. We can do it in about three days. And we're, if you look at a map, you can see you're going from here to here. If, if the whole earth was, uh, if, if it was possible to go around the circumference of the earth, you just drive around. It's not that big of a planet. I can get in an airplane and be in Johannesburg, South Africa in 15 hours. You take all of us and millions more and you put them in cars and those cars start running, SUVs and every other kind of thing. It just makes sense to me that this would start to have a deleterious effect on a fragile environment. I don't think that's a political statement. I think it's common sense. Many are saying that we're living in strange and unusual times when it comes to our environment. There's a DVD that was just recently released. This is not an endorsement of this DVD. It was a full-length movie uh, motion picture that went in theaters. I didn't see it. This is their website. It's called An Inconvenient Truth. Anybody seen this? Absolutely amazing. I mean, it is amazing. It's just, you can go to their, uh, their website there, climatecrisis.net, and, and basically they're saying, hey, listen, we're living in strange and unusual times. The man Eugene Linden that we cited earlier, his book, The Future in Plain Sight, he just released a book this year, 2006, entitled The Winds of Change. Can you read the subtitle there? Climate, Weather, and the Destruction of Civilizations. 
Eugene Linden is not the only one saying these kinds of things. A very well-respected and conservative English scientist by the name of Dr. James Lovelick, Lovelick has written a book called The Revenge of Gaia, Earth's Climate Crisis and the Fate of Humanity. Notice this from the opening uh, introduction of his book. He says, we are now approaching one of these tipping points and our future is like that of the passengers on a small pleasure boat sailing quietly above the Niagara Falls, not knowing that the engines are about to fail. Now, in case you're sitting there saying, oh, well, you know, these are just those crazy liberal scientists. These are those liberal scientists that don't like George Bush. They publish these things to get him out of office. Listen, listen, listen. Uh, this is not a political statement. It's not a what, everyone? I could care less right now about politics. I want to talk about God's Word. But I'll tell you that this man right here, do you know who this man is? That's Tony Blair. That's exactly right. This man is anything but a liberal scientist. In fact, in his own country, he gets all kinds of trouble because they say George Bush has got him in his back pocket. He's not the kind of person that would want to say something to upset his relationship with the United States of America. But look at the date there, 103106. That's one, no, two weeks ago, or not even two weeks ago, about a week ago, he did an, an appeal to world leaders at a science conference, and this is what Mr. Blair said. Again, not some radical, renegade, liberal scientist. This is Tony Blair, our ally in the war on terror, conservative. He said, what is not in doubt is that the scientific evidence of global warming is now overwhelming. Now notice what he says, the consequences for our planet are literally disastrous. If you've ever heard this man speak, he's not a wild-eyed fanatic. I mean, not even close. He's a very sober-minded, very articulate, very intelligent person. He says, this disaster is not set to happen in some science fiction future many years ahead, but in our lifetime. Unless we act now, says Mr. Blair, these consequences, disastrous as they are, will be irreversible. Now, okay, let's just say you disagree with him. That's your prerogative to disagree with him. The point is this. Even non-religious people say we're living in unusual times. Is that clear, yes or no? Yes. That's the point. Increasing violence. Do I need to say anything about this? Do we live in an increasingly violent society? Yeah. Nothing needs to be said here, beloved. Whether it's the television or rap music or video games, Lord have mercy. Look at these video games that people are playing today. I mean, it's so real. I love it when they get these experts on these television programs. My parents used to live in uh, just outside of Columbine, Colorado. In fact, they lived in Columbine when that terrible tragedy took place there and those two boys went in and killed, what was it, 11 or 12 of their classmates and then they'd have these experts on CNN and C-SPAN and other places and they'd say, now, now we'd like to ask you, Dr. So-and-so, so-and-so, you know, we notice that these boys are listening to violent music and they're playing violent video games and they're watching violent television programs. Do you think that it might be possible that there is some causal explanation that maybe it's possible, perhaps, uh, the, the, the things that they're exposing themselves to, these media things, are causing them to do this. Well, you know, we're not sure. And I, I'm thinking, ah, the whole world has gone insane. We don't need to say anything about an increasingly violent society. Jesus said that the, the love of many would wax cold and that the thoughts of men would be only on evil continually at the end of time. Pleasure-driven society, number eight. Is that the society that we live in today? Oh, Lord have mercy. Jesus says at the end of time, the pornography business will be booming. Jesus says at the end of time, everybody is going to be in, interested in sports. Jesus says at the end of time, television is going to be huge. At the end of time, media uh, cinema houses are going to be huge. Pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. Why is pleasure so much uh, on our minds? I'll tell you exactly why it's on our minds. Because we look, we're looking for distractions to keep our minds out of what is really happening in the world today. There's actually a psychological phenomenon here called compartmentalization. It's when, when basically, just imagine with me that you think you're going on vacation to Orlando. You say, oh yeah, you got the whole family loaded up in the SUV and you're, whoo hoo, going to Orlando. And you think you're on your way to Orlando, right? And you're all happy and, oh, this is going to be great in Orlando. Can't wait to get on that beach. And you pass a sign and the sign says Akron. Akron, Ohio. You think, huh, that, oh, that's all right. We're on our way to Orlando. Woo! Turn up the iPod, mm -mm, drive it on your way, and you pass another sign that says Columbus. Wow, never mind that sign anyway. We're on our way to Orlando. Just turn up the music. That's, that's the experience that many are having. But there are signs and indicators that the world is falling apart at the seams, but we just turn it up. Turn up the pleasure so we don't have to think about what's really happening in the world today. Are you following me, everyone, yes or no? Yeah. 
It's a psychological phenomenon called compartmentalization because we don't like to think about these things. And yet Jesus is saying, watch, and Paul is saying, watch, and Peter is saying, watch, and John is saying, watch, and we're saying, yeah, we will watch, must see TV. 2 Timothy chapter 3, notice what Paul said, but know this, that in the last days, what days everyone? The last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. Any parent want to say amen to that? Amen. Unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal. I mean, I just think of those images of some of those terrorists literally hacking the heads off of a man right on television, knowing that their families are going to see it. I mean, brutal. Brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of what, everyone? Pleasure, Pleasure rather than lovers of God. You've got it. Loss of family values. Number nine. Divorce rate is over 50% in the United States. I had the uh, honor, but the, the terribly sad honor last year of burying my grandfather. He was like a father to me. I never had the privilege of meeting my biological father. And so my grandfather was like my dad. I had the privilege last year of, of performing his funeral. I wish he was still with me. He died at the age of 92 years old. And if he would have lived four more months, he and my grandmother, who's still alive, would have been married for 70 years. Beloved, that is the exception today and not the rule. Divorce rate over 50% in the United States. Gay marriage and the homosexual agenda. I mean, beloved, I don't want to say much about this because God loves homosexual people. Can someone say amen to that? But He does not love homosexuality. See, that's the thing. God loves the sinner, but He hates the sin. We're the opposite. We love the sin and hate the sinner. But beloved, when I was in high school, and I want to be very candid here, but, but, but I, let me just, the worst thing that you could have been called was gay. When I was in high school, I mean, you, you get beat up just for somebody suggesting that, that and now it's a happy, oh, hey, everybody's gay now. <laughs> gay and proud, gay and loud. Listen, beloved, there's an agenda going on here. Violent, pleasure-driven society, a godless media. I mean, listen, beloved, these statistics are mind-blowing. 46 million abortions per year globally. 1.37 million per year in the United States in 1996. Absentee parents and detached children. Family values literally eroding right before our very eyes. Look at this statistic. It will just blow your mind. Michael and Diane Medved wrote their book, Saving Childhood. The Wall Street Journal review of this book said that if this isn't an important book, I don't know what an important book looks like. This is from page 19. The average American child will spend more time watching TV by the age of five than they will spend talking to their father in their lifetime. That is the society that you live in. That is the society that your children are growing up in. In 1940, Reader's Digest took a, a poll of the top seven disciplinary problems in schools. Whoo, look at these. Wouldn't you teach any teachers here today? Wouldn't you love to have these? Talking out of turn. Whoo, that was one that I struggled with. Chewing gum in class. Making noise. Running in the hallway. That was another one that uh, I struggled with. Cutting in line. Never struggled with that one. I'd get beat up if I did that. Number six, dress code infractions. I mean, you say to our young people today, dress code. They say, a what code? They don't even know what that is. A dress code. Littering, whoo, those are some real problems. They took the same survey in the year 2000. Top seven uh, problems for, for uh, educators, drug abuse, alcohol abuse, making, uh, that shouldn't be making noise, pregnancy, suicide, rape, and assault. Have times changed, yes or no? Yes. Times have changed. And gospel to all the world. <laughs> Good for you. Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, but notice the greatest sign of all. Matthew chapter 24. Phenomenal. Jesus says, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness. Verse 14, And then the end will come. The greatest sign is that while the world is going down like this, God says that His kingdom will be building up, that the gospel will go to all the world to give everyone a chance to be saved. The gospel is going to all the world. The end, is it here, near, or mere fear? The answer of the Bible is that it's very near. You say, well, how near? The answer is, I don't know, but I do know this. In a world of uncertainty, Bible prophecy provides us with certainty. 
Now you might be saying, well, there's always been earthquakes and there's always been famines and there's always been pestilence and there's always been those things. But remember, what were the two illustrations as we close? The two illustrations, the two analogies that Jesus used were, were labor pains and a budding fig tree. Think about contractions. I don't know them experientially, but I've, I've been with my wife two times through this process and they start far apart and they're not very intense and then they get closer and closer and closer and as they get closer, they get more intense, closer and more intense, closer and more intense. It's not that some new sign would come on, but that the same old signs would be at pitch, uh, fever pitch, at maximum volume, very close together, very intense and that is the world that you live in, beloved. But the good news is, is that the end of this world is the beginning of the world to come. This is not bad news. I mean, it's bad news in a sense, but for the believer, this is all good news. Because this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. You heard that song? My treasures are laid up somewhere along the blue. Beloved, God has a home for you. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me, John chapter 14. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, you may be also. If you're a believer, this world is not your home. It's all about priorities, isn't it? It's all about priorities. Beloved, my, my studied conviction is that we are living in the very toes of this image. And one of the things that we're going to do, one of the several things that we're going to do here in this Bible Prophecy Seminar is to set a sense of urgency to show you this is how it's going to end according to the Bible, not according to one man's ideas or one man's opinion, but according to what the Bible says. This is how it's all going to wrap up. And so you can get ready and stay ready. Can you say Amen. I don't know about you, but I want to be ready. Raise your hand with, you, with me if you want to be ready. You want to say, this world is not my home. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, this world is not our home. We say that by faith. This world is passing away, and it's not just religious people that are saying it. Father, the evidence is in. Very few of us in this room are hardcore scientists and climatologists and astrophysicists, but Father, we have eyes to see the world looks like it's going crazy, Lord. We turn on the television and we know that life is not supposed to be like this. We know that something is wrong. Those of us who have young children are deadly afraid of raising our kids up in this world. How do we even teach them what's right and wrong? Father, give us grace. Father, I want to pray for every person here. I pray that you'll be with their homes, with their families, and Father, help them to be making decisions in their daily lives that indicate that their real priorities are not in this world. It doesn't mean that we can't have a little fun every now and then. Of course, you said that you've come that our life might be full of joy and that we might have life and have it more abundantly. But Father, help us, as Peter said and as Paul said, to be sober and to be serious about the times in which we're living. Father, thank you for bringing us here tonight. Bring us back safely tomorrow night and bind our hearts together with your heart. We ask in Jesus' name, let everyone say, Amen.